Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Chris Hoff and it's time for another Kitchen Table Talk and today I'm going to be talking about the myth of therapist neutrality. So uh, the other day I was scrolling uh, social media and came across a therapist who was promoting their practice, their couples therapy practice, and one of the benefits they claimed was that in couples work they would act as a neutral party and that caught my attention and I wanted to take up this idea today because at best I believe that uh, the idea that a therapist is neutral is naive and at worst it's dangerous. So I'm not sure where this idea comes from, but I imagine it has been born out of the psychoanalytic idea of the therapist as blank slate and this high idea has gained a life of its own and now is commonly propagated across training programs. Uh, and across all kinds of different therapeutic models. So, uh, so can a therapist really be neutral? I say no. So uh, the, question, the questions we ask, the positions we take, and if we do pr uh, traffic in prescriptions and evaluations, all are coming from some place, right? Uh, and these places can include personal life experiences, ideology, theories, etc. All of them privilege some idea of how a life should look or some set of expectations or some ideas of preferred outcomes held by the therapist. So uh, unfortunately, the idea of a therapist as neutral ignores therapist power and also the self of the therapist. And it also, I think more importantly, ignores the fact that therapy is a system of reciprocal mutual influence. So what do we do? So in my training and uh, acting as a supervisor, one of the things I like to do or some of the things I like to do, and I wrote an article or I was part of an article uh, about this, about navigating therapist power, and you should read that article. It's a great article, Justine DiRigo, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Amy Tuttle, and Dr. Carmen Knudsen-Martin all participated in this article of navigating uh, um, therapist power. And uh, in it, we offer some suggestions for training and supervision. And first off is, how do we help people cultivate an ethical stance? How do we, or do we ask people, how do we situate ourselves ethically? In other words, what do we stand for, right? And uh, as a supervisor, I try to bring that stuff forward so uh, that we can then begin to clearly emphasize the connection between clinical choices and one's ethical stance. And even if you think you don't have an ethical stance, that's an ethical stance. It's not a great one, but it is an ethical stance. So one of the things I will commonly ask people, you know, um, is why are you asking the question you're asking? Like what is behind the question? And then it opens up a way of looking at um, what kind of ideas, ideology, theories, or et cetera, are informing the questions that you're asking. And I, and I really want people to know why they're asking the question they're asking. So, so we help cultivate an ethical stance. Uh, we clearly emphasize the connection between clinical choices and one's ethical stance. And you know we continually have conversations or ongoing conversations about power, right? And um, uh, for example, you know, how do we want to use our power? Um, how do we, and like in couples work, for example, I'm never neutral. I'm going to come out there and say it like that because oftentimes I'm, I, I believe my ethical stance is that I should often lend my power to uh, the participant in the couple's family work or whatever that has the least power, right? So maybe making space for somebody to have a voice, making space. Uh, for somebody to hear them, that kind of thing. So, so continually having an ongoing conversations about power with the people I supervise and train, and uh, also making clear that accounting for one's power, even being knowledgeable about power operations, does not cancel out that power. That we always have to be very mindful about our power as therapists. And oftentimes I'll tell new therapists um, that are seeing their first client that uh, immediately that they're going to be surprised, but that, that the power they're afforded by the client that comes into the room, right? That even when you're a brand new therapist, because you step in as the role of the therapist, you are immediately afforded the discourse of power around that role. So, um, so it's very, very important that we know 
what comes with that. So, so then there are questions about how do we determine how we're willing to use the power. I, you know, I like those kinds of conversations with the people I supervise and train. Um, are you willing, you know, some questions you might ask, are you willing to confront uh, critical social issues, even if it privileges your knowing over the client? Uh, another question you might ask, are, are you more interested in privileging the client's lead, even if it means missing an opportunity to attend to a critical social issue? So those begin to open up questions about your ethical stance, what your preferences are as a therapist and how you want to do um, like justice work and therapy or that kind of thing. And what what kind of role do you want to do it more more activist or do you want to be more collaborative in that effort, that kind of thing. And so. You know, at the end of the day, um, the solution, I think, to a lot of this, uh, to, to maybe, you know, avoiding um, our own biases in therapy is to maintain as best we can that curious uh, inquiry position. And I love a quote. I'm going to end with a quote by Michael White, one of the co-creators of Narrative Therapy that somebody shared with me and I've always kind of held on to. And that was that it, he said once that um, our job is not to get out in front of our clients. Our job is to stand behind our clients, look over their shoulder and ask them what they see. And I, I, when I hold on to that, um, my work goes much better. So hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully you're enjoying a coffee. And uh, my name is Dr. Chris Hoff. This has been another Kitchen Table Talk. Uh, thanks for listening. Peace.